examination. Doctor, I'll just remind you that you're under oath as opposed to placing you under oath again. You're still under oath from the last time you testified. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Sachs, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Scott. Good morning. Uh, I think we left off. <coughs> I asked you, uh, what did you determine from your review of uh, prior mental health uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and mental health records? So I reviewed the history of his psychological records, academic and testing records, really starting from even pre-K. And some of the key findings uh, that you could see in preschool, he did have early developmental delays. He had delays in both receptive and expressive language when he was even as young as three and a half. And so he was subsequently placed in small uh, classrooms. He then eventually went to kindergarten. He was evaluated in kindergarten. He went to kindergarten twice. He did repeat kindergarten. Uh, the second kindergarten year, uh, he was in some mainstream classes as well. One of his teachers was Mrs. Booth, and she commented how well he did. They held him back in kindergarten, even though he did meet promotion criteria to the first grade. They thought it would be best still to continue to uh, observe and watch him. It was during this time that he was started on a medication for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, also known as ADHD. The medicine was called Concerta. And one of the teachers noted that particularly in things like remembering his numbers and in math, he did substantially better once he was started on the stimulant medicine, indicating that it was helpful at that point for improving his concentration. Uh, during his first grade, and I'm going to march hopefully fairly briefly through the evals from first through up to 10th and 11th grade. But in the first grade, he was in some mainstream classes, but he had what we call ESC, which is Exceptional Student Ed Education Support. So he had support through speech and language therapy. He had uh, counselor support and other support even in some of the classrooms. First grade did not go extremely well for him. There was some concern that the stimulant medication had been advanced from 18 to 54 milligrams during that time, and that that may have played a role in some increase in anxiety or agitation. So there was a medication change during that time frame. But because of the concerns overall, he was uh, again placed in cluster classes. As I understand, cluster classes, they're small classrooms, sometimes three, sometimes seven students. Sometimes it's a mix of uh, you can be in a regular education classroom, but you have special attention in a cluster group. It just depends on the year. And so the second and third grade, uh, he was in these support classes. Uh, again, when he was younger, at about age five, he was tested for IQ testing. And IQ testing at that time was relatively low. It was below average. It was around 77. And I mentioned that so you can see when he is tested over time as the years progress, does his IQ stay at that level or does it increase over time? So that's, that was one of his first testings around age uh, five, five and a half. Uh, he was also noted early on to have some impairments in some of his adaptive functioning. And that also was a reason he was eligible for both speech and language courses and also uh, emotional or behavioral disturbance classes. So in the third grade, he moves up. He's in also a cluster class. And although he was in a very structured cluster class at the time, third grade did not go particularly well for him. Uh, again, there were some concerns that a medicine he was on, uh, it was called Stratera, may have played a role in his agitation. It was unclear. So they adjusted the medication for him and he had some medication adjustments during that time frame. So he continued through elementary school. He went to the fourth grade. And during the fourth grade, as they, in Florida, they had at the time, they have ongoing uh, achievement tests. So it's the uh, Florida Comprehensive Achievement Test, also known as the FCAT. 
And so this is a measure, are you at least compared to other peers or other students in your age range? How are you doing? And it helps establish at least some baseline. So in the fourth grade, they tested two main areas and they alternate the years, which areas of or subjects they're testing. This was reading and math. In the reading, he was above the cutoff level for being or meeting the achievement. So it did indicate he had made some uh, reading gains, had improved since uh, his preschool and his first grade years. Uh, he was below the cutoff, though, on math. He was promoted to the fifth grade. In the fifth grade, he was primarily in what's known as inclusion classes or mainstream classes. If you look at his individualized education plan, also known as an IEP, uh, he was about 80% time there in a mainstream class. So they are having some increased exposure in mainstream classes. But he continued to have some of the other support that you get as an ESA student. In the fifth grade, if you look at his improvement in reading and in math over the year, a couple of things stand out. Again, he's having, in some ways, a positive forward trajectory academically. So his teacher, Mrs. Weiner, does uh, conference notes about every uh, three or four months or so in the school. And he was at or above reading level in the fifth grade. For the first two conference uh, records, he was slightly below or below uh, the math goal. But by the final uh, report, he was meeting at or above both reading and in math. So it looked like he had uh, made improvements compared to what the earlier records had shown when he was much younger. So he goes to uh, West Glades Middle School, that's in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and he's primarily in mainstream classes, but he does continue to have, and he's eligible for that extra support. So that can include things like a counselor at school uh, and other support services as needed. And Grade-wise, his grades weren't great in the sixth grade, but his behavior was pretty good. And then he gets towards the end of his sixth grade year, and his behavior does start to change, indicating that he had done fairly well with the behavior initially, but now there's a behavior change. When you go through the records at that time, you can see in the sixth, seventh, and part of the eighth grade that he... Uh, does tell that he's trying to make friends, get attention from others, wants to be popular, and that by his report, acting out in certain ways will have uh, students notice him. So if he teases a teacher or uh, has a prank in the class or misbehaves, he'll get uh, attention from others. That starts by the seventh and eighth grade to kind of backfire in the sense that he is getting in more trouble uh, academically and also certainly behaviorally. And the seventh and eighth grade are particularly notable for a lot of behavioral disturbances. We covered some of those uh, the last time uh, I testified and there was a good bit of impulsive behavior described, uh, thing with individuals with conduct disorder and antisocial personality disorder is that they can have both impulsive behaviors, but they can also have planned behaviors. So I'm not sure when I was talking about impulsive versus predatory, if I made that clear, they oftentimes go together in conduct disorder and in antisocial personality disorder. So he did have a history of impulsive behavior and that was noted throughout the junior high records, but that doesn't mean that he can't also plan. They are not in any way mutually exclusive. Because of the problems he was having in the eighth grade, he had psychological evaluations. One was done by a Dr. Jennifer Klein. Uh, kind of backing up a little bit, he had, I believe around, oh, maybe the third or fourth grade, he did have his IQ retested and that was also done by Dr. Klein when he was in the third grade. And it was no longer 77. I think her score at that time was around uh, 93, which would have been 
uh, certainly within the average range uh, at that time. So he had made a, uh, a jump also on his academic and IQ scoring from that testing. So that was a big improvement. Uh, they, were, they were very concerned, though, about the behaviors at Westglade. So they had a functional behavioral analysis uh, to try to understand what was causing the behavior and what was the potential reward for the behavior. Uh, so he got reassessed um, by a psychosocial assessment, by a social worker. He has Henderson Behavioral Health coming in, working in the home. Uh, they have ongoing in-home treatment. The mother eventually gets her own parent advocate to help her with parenting training. And ultimately, they feel that the best um, help for him will be transferred to a school known as Cross Creek, which again is to help uh, students that may have emotional or behavioral difficulties. And when he got transferred to Cross Creek, he got transferred to Cross Creek in uh, about February-ish or March of his eighth grade year. So he didn't complete his eighth grade at Westglades. So when he got transferred uh, to Cross Creek, uh, he had a significant behavioral improvement. If you look at his classroom notes and records, he was noted to make nearly all A's and B's, get on the honor roll, had a dramatic improvement in his behavior. So it did look like that structure was helpful to him. But it also shows that even if he needed the structure, he could accomplish uh, and make academic gains. So he had the brain power, if you will. He had the executive ability and executive functioning, and the structure may have shown what he was capable of as far as his actual academic abilities. He did so well at Cross Creek that eventually the IEP teams decided, and he wanted to go to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, that it, uh, he would be appropriate to go there. So he was ultimately transferred there in the uh, ninth grade, and he had two classes in the morning at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. One was the JROTC, and I believe the other might have been a language arts class, and then he did complete uh, his other uh, work up back to Cross Creek. They would have a bus that would take him to Cross Creek uh, in the ninth grade. Uh, his grades were extremely good during that time frame. And uh, again, he was having substantial increases academically. So his IQ had, noted, had been noted to be higher even since elementary school. His grades improved dramatically. And uh, another area you can monitor how he improved over time Periodically, they gave him tests known as the DAR, which is the Diagnostic Assessment of Reading. And you can see how he improves in different scores. So, for example, in the 10th grade, when he took the Diagnostic Assessment of Reading, on, in some areas, not all, he was even now reading above grade level. Spelling was a challenge. Spelling, he was lower than grade level. And I think that was noted throughout his records that spelling was one of his... Uh, literary weaknesses, if you will. And then in about August of 2016, this is going to be the summer before he was to start his 11th grade year, uh, he had a breakup uh, with his girlfriend, uh, first significant relationship, as he's described it, to me and to others. And that was noted to really have a spiraling down of his academic performance, uh, but also his behavioral performance. And so when you look at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas records, as he's entering the 11th grade, there was a dramatic change. So his grades dropped. Uh, he was failing certain subjects. He was having increase in behavioral problems noted. And in my opinion, this is not explained by a sudden loss of his uh, brain to function, it was really the reaction to and breakup to this girlfriend. And this is noted throughout the records. So Henderson Behavioral Health is back engaged and involved. He has a counselor known as Jared Benenfield, and the breakup is noted repeatedly as being one of the, if not the most significant impact on why his grades, grades do go down. And eventually, 
at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. He uh, leaves because uh, he doesn't necessarily want to go back to Cross Creek, and so he voluntarily gives up his ESC classification, but ultimately he does not stay at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. He ultimately goes and attends different off-campus learning centers, and I can talk about his performance and those later. So that's briefly a summary of some of his academic. I do want to highlight some of his psychiatric evals and follow up over time because they kind of parallel this summary of his schooling that I've talked to you about. So again, early on, he was diagnosed at a very young age, around six, with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This was even potentially considered at age three and a half, but at six, he started on medications for that. And that was the diagnosis through multiple uh, child and adolescent psychiatrists, through counselors, through uh, people from Henderson Behavioral Health, uh, through school psychologists. There were times when he was in the third grade. He also was noted to have uh, anxiety and that was described in the Henderson behavioral records. But it was around the same time that they were concerned about the Stratera medicine, maybe also causing some anxiety and agitation. But he did have some anxiety and worries noted, certainly in early and uh, middle uh, school as well. The other diagnoses that were considered by the psychiatrist was conduct disorder that was noted uh, by the, uh, at least one or two of the psychiatrists that evaluated him. It was noted by the Henderson Behavioral Counselor and by a subsequent evaluator so, and his pediatrician. So there were multiple evaluators who felt that that was also an appropriate diagnosis. And then finally, there was a consideration. It's called a rule out for a pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. And what that means is the person may have some characteristics of a pervasive developmental disorder, such as problems communicating, problems with special or repetitive interest, but they don't really meet the full criteria for something known as, for example, autistic spectrum disorder. And on Tuesday when I talked to you, I gave you some of the more obvious examples uh, that people think of when they think of autism lack of eye contact or not using uh, nonverbal communication. But there are certainly more subtle signs, and so that doesn't in and of itself represent autism uh, at all. But when he was evaluated by the child psychiatrist, and that was a consideration, they did not think that he did meet the criteria for autism. It was repeatedly noted that he had impaired or they had problems with social skills. Uh, and so that was noted in most of the child psychiatrist record. The last child psychiatrist to see him prior to the shooting on February the 14th, 2018 was Brett Nagan. Uh, he saw him and was going to start another medication to help with some of the mood changes and the irritability. And it's unclear if he actually ever took it or not, uh, but it was prescribed and then there was no further follow up with that psychiatrist. So if I had to sum up all of that, I would say he had a long history of ADHD. Um, he had conduct disorder repeatedly noted in the record. He was evaluated for learning disabilities and certainly he had learning disabilities more prominent when he was younger. Uh, he was noted to academically improve or have the capacity over time. And that was true also for his IQ. And although there was a mention in early records of obsessive compulsive disorder, the records did not actually establish the criteria for that. And so I think that sums up most of the records. Okay, and what was your observations about the, the defendant's suggestibility? So in uh, my interview, there are certain ways that you can look to see if a person uh, may be overly suggestible or not. One way is if you say something that uh, is incorrect, uh, do they correct you? Do they say, no, doc, that's not right? And uh, for example, I might say on more than one occasion, Walmarts, and it was Walgreens, and he would not be suggestible as far as taking the wrong word I said. He frequently 
would remind me if I had already asked him that question and he would say, I told you all that already. I didn't think he was being rude, but he was just reminding me that that question had already been asked and so that indicated that he was uh, aware and he was correct. The questions had been uh, asked. He had already told me that information. And so I thought if I got something wrong, if I had a question that uh, he didn't understand, he could ask me about it. He wouldn't necessarily answer it. If it was uh, a wrong, he would correct me. So he did not appear to be suggestible in my interview. Okay, and what did you determine uh, from uh, his uh, prior um, treatment and interventions? Right, so he had a host of interventions throughout his life. So even early on, starting in um, preschool and forward, he was, as I mentioned, in sort of small classes, but he also had uh, in-home interventions and extensive in-home interventions. People would come out primarily from Henderson Behavioral Health and do behavioral therapy. You might have a tokens that were given you know, for good behavior. Uh, treatment specifically related to uh, coping with stress or uh, trying to lessen impulsive reactions. So stop and think method, for example. Breathing uh, exercises, for example. Uh, he had medication therapy throughout, uh, treated by psychiatrists. He had uh, at-school counseling with different counselors, and that included uh, John Noonan, who was his counselor at school, doing family therapy really throughout much of the elementary school. He also had a psychologist, Dr. Kravitz, who saw the family as well, off and on. And that um, Henderson Behavioral Health continued really through about the 11th grade. In the 11th grade, after he had a fight at school and there were some concerns about his behavior, he, but he ultimately elected not to continue further with Henderson Behavioral Health. So he had family therapy, individual therapy, small group at home, in-school counseling, uh, parent advocacy training, medication treatment throughout, and uh, he even had in the community where the counselors would suggest that he do some type of community work. So be at work at the YMCA or perhaps at a park. So he had multiple wraparound interventions. Okay. Did what your review, did you make it a determination about the defendant's ability to control his behavior? Yes, so I went through the records really, again, starting from uh, pre-K all the way up to the uh, time of the crime, and you see a mixed picture, which is what I described earlier. Um, he did certainly have times where he was impulsive in his reaction to others and had impulsivity. And again, that is a characteristic of conduct disorder and, and antisocial personality disorder. But he also demonstrated the ability to control his behavior at different times uh, when he wanted to. Some of this you can note as early as the first grade. So there's one note by his first grade teacher that talks about how they're trying to ask him to move or do something, and he didn't comply. But they had a school resource officer. His name was Officer, I think, Cashel. And when he came, he immediately did comply. And this uh, sort of on and off again, ability to control the behavior when he wanted to. You see also, for example, in the seventh grade, he's at West Glades now. He has an ESE counselor who's helping him. And at one point, the ESE counselor is saying, you know, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, Nicholas, you know, why are you doing these things in class and why are you acting out or behaving in this way? And she said, you don't do this in the fourth grade period. And he goes, well, that teacher's strict and she won't let me get away with it or she doesn't let students get away with anything. So again, an example of being able to uh, control the behavior at times, even if he had impulsive acts at other times. When he went into the eighth grade, he had a teacher, Ms. John, and she did document a lot of his different behaviors and how he'd behave when people would come in the room in addition to when she was teaching. And there was a vice principal 
His name was Mr. Lindsay, and he would come in sometimes uh, for support and to observe. And when Mr. Lindsay would come into the room, uh, Nicholas would have no behavioral difficulties, even if around the time before and after he might, indicating he had the ability to control at that time, but he didn't. And then there's one example in this John documents and the records where the teacher, I'm sorry, the vice principal came in the room. He left after about 15 minutes. And then Nicholas, you know, said, I'm glad he's gone and had some other comments negative about the vice principal. And the behaviors then ultimately resumed. Uh, as he got older, uh, he was, after he left Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, he was on his own going to the off-campus learning center classes. And he, at times, was uh, taking you know, transportation, such as the bus there. He also uh, got a job in December of 2016 at the Dollar Tree. And one of his, or his primary job duty, was as a cashier there. And so he's working at the Dollar Tree. A range of different people come in. And he was noted to have uh, no behavioral difficulties in the evaluations of him. Uh, he reacted and interacted with a range of people that came into the store, and he was noted to control uh, his behavior throughout. So although he may have some impulsive behaviors noted in the record, he also showed the ability to control his behavior at different times. Both in and out of school? Both in and out of school. And what about, uh, you mentioned something about his academic performance. Uh, could you go in more detail uh, about how that relates to uh, what you described? Right. So um, one of the uh, distinguishing factors uh, from the intellectual performance and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and other disorders such as attention deficit disorder and to some degree other neurodevelopmental disorders is their trajectory, meaning how do they do over time. And when you look at the literature on individuals with a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, typically if they are described to kind of plateau, which means kind of just go to a baseline around age 12 or 13, and their executive functioning and some of their social and control issues typically don't improve over time in contrast to attention deficit disorder which can improve over time, about 50% will have a lessening of symptoms. And so when you look again at his academic performance, he, in contrast to what is written about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, improved over time uh, academically. His IQ is noted again uh, to improve from the 77 to 93, but also his grades improved to the point where when he was at Cross Creek in that first year at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, he was on the honor rolls uh, doing very well. So I think academically, for me, that helped distinguish a very different trajectory than what you would expect if someone did have the kind of brain deficits described for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Dr. Scott, what is your experience with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? And I'm including in that, you know, it's an umbrella, uh, the neuro, uh, neurological development disorder uh, due to prenatal, prenatal alcohol exposure and also, which is NDPAE, and also alcohol-related neurodevelopment disorder, uh, ARND. Sure. So uh, even in both medical school and my internship, we were aware that alcohol could have impact on the fetus if consumed during pregnancy. And so working through OBGYN and pediatric rotations, uh, we would certainly screen the mother's history to look at exposure, uh, certainly screen for some of the classic physical signs of fetal alcohol syndrome. And then uh, when I went into my child psychiatry training at UCSF, I worked in a developmental disabilities clinic, uh, evaluating for potential causes of developmental delays, uh, so looking at uh, potential autism, Asperger syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome, attention deficit disorder, or other causes medically 
of a neurodevelopmental uh, disorder delay. And so I've mentioned some of the differences and how you try to distinguish between the group. Uh, like I said earlier today, um, autism is on a spectrum, and you can have many subtle signs and symptoms of it. You don't necessarily have to have the poor eye contact or the lack of uh, social reciprocity. Uh, so there's a range of other things that you examine and look at. In my opinion, looking at his history over time, he did not meet the other criteria for autism. For fetal alcohol syndrome, again, you're looking at what does the literature show about how they do over time. And a couple of things that are important when you're making this distinction, and I appreciate it's an important distinct, uh, distinction in this case. So is this pattern more consistent with fetal alcohol syndrome or attention deficit disorder, conduct disorder, and or antisocial personality disorder? What are the like, two or three things you'd look at? One we've mentioned, and that is, did the person's academic performance plateau around age 12, 13, or did their executive functioning improve over time? His improved over time. Secondly, fetal alcohol syndrome does have impulsive aggression associated with it. That is a characteristic feature where they may have kind of impulsive acts. And he certainly had impulsive aggression and impulsivity. One thing that is not described, however, for fetal alcohol syndrome is the ability, as you'll see coming up to the crime, to have planned, premeditated, organized aggression. That's not a characteristic typically of fetal alcohol syndrome, although it is written that impulsive aggression is. What is characteristic of more planned, predatory aggression? Conduct disorder? and antisocial personality disorder. And remember, impulsivity is characteristic also of folks with antisocial personality disorder, and it's also characteristic of fetal alcohol syndrome. So it's not one or the other, but you have to look at, if you look at all the evidence, what's more, what's more true or characteristic of the long-term kind of lifespan of this individual. And again, the kind of end premeditated types of aggression are not characteristic of fetal alcohol syndrome, but are for ASPD. Meaning antisocial personality disorder. Yes, meaning antisocial personality disorder. Okay. In your career, Dr. Scott, how many people have you evaluated for <clears throat> FASD, ARND, or NDPE? When you put all of those together in one large group, um, including attention deficit disorder, probably in the hundreds, if not thousands, if you combine all of them. Okay. So did you consider FASD or NDPAE or ARND in this case? Yeah, I, I, I carefully considered that. Um, again, I looked at, as we talked about on Tuesday, the birth records. Uh, there's mixed evidence in those about how much exposure, although I realize there are witnesses now that have come forth and described a significant more amount of exposure than the birth records did. Uh, I looked at the academic records and performance. I looked at the type of aggression that evolved over time. And I looked at, again, the, the improvement in executive functioning over time. And in my opinion, those are better accounted for by antisocial personality disorder and to some degree borderline, borderline personality disorder. And that's why you d considered it but felt that uh, that wasn't applicable. Yes. Uh, his trajectory of improving academic and executive functioning is in contrast to what's been written and described for individuals with fetal alcohol syndrome who are described as plateauing with their executive functioning around age 12 or 13. His had the opposite pathway. He improved. Does uh, NDPAE or ARND or FASD, the whole spectrum, does that cause someone to murder people? No. I mean, if you... Um, had that theory and said individuals with fetal alcohol syndrome, i.e. were then murderers, then you would, you would, based on the reported numbers of folks with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, you would see a rash of homicides and murders much, much higher than uh, uh, you, you, you could expect. What does, what is known to be associated with an increased violence, particularly premeditated aggression and violence, is antisocial personality disorder and conduct disorder. Could you please, you mentioned it, uh, 
predatory aggressiveness and impulsive aggressiveness. Could you describe the difference? Yes, it's an important difference. And again, people can have both. An impulsive aggression might be, let's say, uh, you're walking into the local mall and someone bumps up against you and you're the kind of person or the personality, this is just one example, where that might kind of irritate you, you might feel disrespected, and then you turn around and, and hit the person. You didn't have much time to plan that aggression, obviously. You didn't know the person. So that would be one example of kind of an impulsive, uh, aggressive act. Uh, if you're offended by something, if you don't want to do something, you may yell out, have a, throw something, that could be impulsive aggression. In contrast, predatory or planned aggression typically involves some thinking about what you're going to do in advance. Impulsive, you have little time to reflect on your actions versus planning. So if, for example, a person does research about what they want to do, if they learn and uh, gather more information to improve what they want to do, if they choose a particular time, if they choose a particular weapon, a particular target, location, place, this is all an example of not quickly reacting on the moment's notice, but planned premeditated aggression. And again, that's not characteristic of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, but it is characteristic of antisocial personality disorder. And I want to emphasize that you can have both with ASPD. So just because you have impulsive aggression does not mean you can't also have planned aggression. A lot I've worked in prisons for many years and, and jails. And so you can have inmates who impulsively aggress upon others, but they also can plan a burglary or a crime, for example. It's not uncommon to have both. And uh, you mentioned uh, the DSM-5TR. Uh, Could you explain to us uh, um, in the back of the DSM-5TR, uh, it talks about conditions for further study. What does that mean? Right. So um, there is, in every volume of our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, there are conditions that uh, have been suggested that might be a disorder, but there aren't, are not yet enough research or evidence to include it in a manual where you would make that diagnosis. So it's in a section called Conditions for Further Study. And basically it says the evidence has not been reached, nor is there a consensus yet that it should be a, prim a primary mental disorder that would be diagnosed by psychiatrists, psychologists, or other people that use the DSM. Okay, and NDPAE is um, under Conditions for Further Study, correct? Um, it's under, it is under the conditions for further study. I think it's the neurobehavioral disorder associated with fetal alcohol. Okay. And what does it say? I think it's page 903 that talks about how you should consider um, conditions for further study. Right. So what they, I'll just read their language. It says that um, these criteria sets are presented for conditions on which future research is encouraged, it is hoped that such research will allow the field to better understand these conditions and inform future decisions about possible placement in the forthcoming editions. And again, it says the specific items, thresholds, and durations contained in these research sets were set by expert consensus. And it gives some examples of expert consistence, uh, of consensus. And it says they're intended to provide a common language for researchers and clinicians who are interested in studying these disorders. But ultimately, the task force determined there was insufficient evidence to warrant inclusion of these proposals as an official mental disorder. Okay, uh, Dr. Scott, now, um, did you uh, review 